Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sien Lung, NUS Pro Chancellor, Professor S. Jai Kumar, NUS Chairman, Mr. Xie Fu Hua, NUS Senior Deputy President and Provost, Professor Ho Tech Hua. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the book launch of A History of the People's Action Party, 1985 to 2021. I'm told I can take off my mask to speak uh, by Shashi Jai Kumar. My name is Peter Schopert. I'm the director of NUS Press, the proud publisher of the book. Given the constraints we have on uh, how many people we can get in the room and our desire to have as many of you with us as we could, I'm also doubling as our MC for this event. Thank you for bearing with us for this and our other safe distancing measures. Um, I hope they don't constrain too much the celebration that a book like this really does deserve. Uh, the rundown of events is quite straightforward. I'll conclude these opening remarks shortly. Um, the author will speak, and then we will have the distinct honor of hearing from the, our guest of honor, the Secretary General of the People's Action Party, Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sien Long. After his remarks, he will very kindly help us launch the book, and we'll take some photos, and that will conclude um, the morning ceremonial. It's a brave historian who writes a contemporary history. That historian is brave on at least two fronts. First, the contemporary historian writes about people who are very much with us. You will see in the book that interviews form a very important source uh, for the book. And of course, interviewees have their own views. And they can read what you've said about them. They can answer back. They might even be in the room when you launch the book. They might even be invited to launch the book for you. Secondly, the contemporary historian must give a judgment on events as they are still current, as they are playing out. Uh, there may be breaking news, just as one is forced to send the proofs to the, to the printing press. Uh, as you may know, we postponed the book from its initial announcement date, as Shashi's short afterward, uh, mentioning the 2020 general election, turned into a fully-fledged chapter. Uh, the contemporary historian is continually chasing after the march of time. So that's our end point, the aftermath of the 2020 general election, the first six months of 2021. The book begins in 1985, in the aftermath of the December 1984 general election, and also at that around the same time, the announcement of the plans for the succession of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as prime minister. Many of you will remember that period well. As it happens, I, I do too, having arrived in Singapore in 1984 on a fellowship to study Singapore politics here at NUS. So I remember that, that sense of what was going to happen, of change. As a young graduate student, my orientation to Singapore politics and the People's Action Party was heavily influenced by a book written by Professor Chan Heng Chi, The Dynamics of One Party Dominance, the PAP at the Grassroots which was published some years earlier by Singapore University Press, and I purchased a copy soon after arriving. I mentioned Prof Chan's book partially to give a genealogy to Shashi's effort of writing the history of the party. Of course, he, he cites it. But also to give a genealogy to the publication of Shashi's book by the University Press of our national university. The book we launched today is just the latest book published on the region and on the history and politics uh, that go in a line actually back to the days of the University of Singapore and before at the University of Malaya. Uh, NUS Press is the heir to a publishing operation that began in the 1950s. Uh, the university at that time held the conviction that a nation to be needed to grow its own publishing, uh, needed to have the means for creating and certifying knowledge. After all, that's what publishing, academic publishing is. And disseminating that knowledge to the world, of course, but also publishing for Singapore responding to Singapore's own values and priorities, having a platform to decide to choose one example, what words like democracy might mean for Singapore and for our own situation here. I'll stop there. You're not here to listen to me, certainly not when the author and our distinguished guests of honor are next. I thank you very much for your politeness and your patience. It remains for me only to say that while NUS has very generously purchased a copy of Shashi's book for you, our guests, uh, and he's very generously inscribed them, there are more copies uh, available for sale outside at a specially discounted price. So don't miss your chance. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Shashi Jayakumar. 
head of the Center of Excellence for National Security at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. When you read the book, I believe you will agree with me that though he's a scholar trained in medieval history, and though in his day job he writes about current events and issues on the horizon, he has managed the task of writing a history of the last 36 years with exemplary balance, judiciously, and with considerable flair. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the author of A History of the People's Action Party, Dr. Shashi Jackson. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung, I'm honored that you are here to launch this book. Mr. Ong Pang Boon, the earliest organizing secretary of the PAP and former minister, retired and serving MPs comrades, NUS Pro Chancellor Prof Jai Kumar, NUS Board Chairman Mr. Sia Fu Hua, NUS Senior Deputy President and Provost Mr. Prof Fotek Hua, dear friends and family who have made the time, thank you sincerely for coming to this launch. This book has occupied the greater part of the last 10 years of my life. The idea for the book came, some of you may know, from the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I interviewed him for this book and also for other works which have seen since been published. He was, even in the last years of his life, constantly thinking about the future of Singapore, about what impact world events would have on us. His life's work was Singapore. On this present book, History of the PAP, when Mr. Lee briefed me, it was clear that he wanted something which could be a complement to other existing histories, such as Men in White, which was published in 2009. Something certainly which could tell the story of the party, and I hope I've done that, but also to tell the story and challenges of the party as it tried to govern, and paths sometimes difficult as it had to navigate as it made policy. And he wanted people young people in particular, to understand these things. I'm deeply sorry that the book was not complete when Mr. Lee was still with us. I would say one thing, more as a personal observation. As I dived deeper into the sources and spoke to more people, this became a personal voyage of exploration for me. My own views began to change, to be refined somewhat, and in some areas, when it came to people, and in other areas when it came to institutions or policies. There are many themes and ideas in this book, and I do not have time to enumerate on all of them. I also hope you will read the book. But I did briefly want to highlight two points. And the first is renewal. This is felt to be an urgent imperative. From the very beginning, party files show that Mr. Lee was thinking about the issue at an extraordinarily early point from the early 1960s, in fact. I really find this amazing. In this area of renewal, things which see fruition much later, <clears throat> time and again, were being thought of by Mr. Lee and others within the party from a very early stage. The second is responsiveness. The party has always felt it imperative to be attuned to the needs, desires and aspirations of the people. Important ground sentiment must be ventilated upwards and discussed by the leadership. So many of the feedback mechanisms and even parliamentary innovations for bringing in these diverse views take place later in the 1980s. But in my research, I found time and time again that these were being thought of in a preliminary way by Mr. Lee and close colleagues again as early as the 1960s. Part of this responsiveness is also about the largely unsung, unsung work done by PAP MPs on the ground, building rapport with constituents, trying new ways to do outreach, even as the times and the people changed. So even though the book does cover, as one might expect, high politics, the leadership, succession, and policymaking, there is a lot of party work I hope I've captured in the book, which is not about these things and I thought it right to try to cast the light on these issues and the people who make the party tick at the grassroots. I've gone through files, interviewed many individuals. Some MPs who agreed to be interviewed are here today. I'd like to thank them, and also many others who are not here, and others who spoke on background. There are too many to list, but I'll be failing in my duty if I did not mention Mr. Lao Ping Sam, former organizing secretary of the party, Mr. Lao Gif, gave helpful views 
throughout the 10 years of research. He even signposted events and themes, and at various points, other former organizing secretaries, Mr. Tang Si Chim, who is here, and Dr. Ao Chin Hock, who regrettably cannot be here today, also assisted. Throughout the process, I found very helpful earlier work done on the party. Besides Men in White, Ambassador Chan's work has already been mentioned by Peter. Dr. Chiang Hai Ding is here. He has edited with Ron Kamis an extremely readable book, We Also Served, which has reflections and remembrances by PAP MPs. I sincerely hope that more work of this type will be done on the party. There is a feel, I feel, a lot more that can, can be said. I mentioned those interviews that I conducted with various individuals. There are some who prefer not to speak for various reasons, and I respect this. But I still hope in time to come, more will step forward to tell their own personal stories, and perhaps to write themselves, lest the part they played be forgotten. The PAP story, like the Singapore story, is continually evolving. A future historian in time to come will no doubt tell the next leg of the party story, using new accounts and new sources, and tell of how the party has adapted to new challenges. I would finally like to thank NUS and Peter Shoppert and his team for shepherding this project through. It's now my distinct honour and great pleasure to invite the Secretary General of the People's Action Party and Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Hsien Lung, to address us and officially launch this book. Thank you. Professor S. Jayakumar, Pro-Chancellor of NUS, Mr. Sia Fu Hua, Chairman of NUS, Professor Hu Teck Hua, Senior Deputy President and Provost, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to join you today to launch the book, A History of the People's Action Party, 1985-2021, to by Dr. Sashi Jayakumar. The book tells the story of the PAP, not from its foundings or early beginnings, but beyond the initial years of struggle for independence and the first two decades of nation building. In fact, the book starts from 1985. Why 1985? Those familiar with Singapore's history will recognize the year as a turning point in our political development. The transition from the founding generation of PAP leaders to a successor team was in its final stages. A pivotal general election had just taken place in December 1984. In that election, many of the PAP old guards either retired from politics or stepped down from leadership roles. In the new cabinet, from the founding generation, only Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, and Mr. E. W. Barker remained. After the election, the younger ministers chose Mr. Go Chok Tong to be their leader, and he became the first Deputy Prime Minister. A record number of fresh faces, 24 new MPs, were brought in, including quite a few who eventually formed the 3G leadership team, and I was one of them. The 1984 general election witnessed not just a transition in the leadership, but also a generational change in the electorate. The PAP's vote share fell sharply by 12.9 percentage points. For the first time since independence, the party received less than 70% of the total votes. Two opposition candidates were elected, Mr. J.B. Jayaratnam and Anson re-elected, and Mr. Chiam Si Tong in Potong Pasir for the first time. At the post-election press conference, Mr. Lee interpreted the election results using a biblical reference. He described it as the inevitable transition from the independence generation to a new generation of voters who knew not 
Joseph. He explained that the older generation who stuck with the party through the baptism of fire during merger and Malaysia and in the early years of independence were beginning to fade away, to be replaced with a younger generation that was better educated, more demanding of their leaders, and that had not experienced the struggles or known the hardships their parents' generation went through. It seemed like the PAP was losing political dominance. It was a moment for introspection, perhaps even concern. What did the future hold for the party and for Singapore? This made 1985 a logical starting point for the book. But from the perspective of telling a good story, the PAP history post-1985 was probably a harder book for Sashi to write than its history pre-1985. The party's early years, pre-1985, were full of drama and excitement. The postman's strike in 1952, the founding of the party two years later, 1954, the close partnership with the trade union movement fighting to improve the lives of workers, the struggle for self-government and independence, cooperation with the pro-communist left wing followed by the inevitable parting of ways. The mortal battles with the communists and then the communalists to merger, separation, independence and building a nation from scratch. Whereas the post-1985 story has been one of relative calm and stability. Year after year, Singapore continued to sustain its strong growth and rapid transformation we stayed cohesive and united as a nation. We carried out two leadership transitions smoothly, from the 1G to the 2G, then from the 2G to the 3G. There was steady progress, but not so much thunder and lightning. If someone made a movie out of the PAP story, you might be forgiven for overlooking the sequel. But in its own quiet way, this later part of our history was no less momentous or remarkable. Imagine being back in 1985, crystal ball gazing what the next 35 or 36 years had in store for Singapore. Many were anxious about the leadership succession, about more fractious politics, about significant changes to leadership direction and government. After all, this had happened in many countries which came into being after the war, a decade, a decade or two earlier than us, like in India, Israel, or Korea, beyond their founding generations. Others even predicted the failure of the Singapore model. The party leadership themselves were quietly resolved to build on our solid foundations, renew themselves, and take the country forward. But even they could not confidently predict that for another 35 years, post-1985, the PAP would earn the strong support and trust from new generations of Singaporeans, keep itself vigorous and effective, dominate Singapore politics, provide Singapore with good and effective government, and take Singapore from the third world to the first and beyond. This has been a story of stability and progress, of evolution, not revolution, of patient building and improving, of ensuring that tomorrow would be better than today. Having lived through these decades, Singaporeans may not consider our stability, progress and success astonishing. But in fact, this was hardly predicted, much less foreordained. Far from it. It didn't happen by itself, nor has it happened in very many other countries. And yet, it happened in Singapore. How did Singapore manage to achieve this? The PAP is an important part of the explanation. This is what makes the party's history from 1985 to 2021 a story well worth telling and understanding. Shashi's book, 
explains how the PAP has sought to build a cohesive society in Singapore, build understanding and consensus across different groups, and improve the lives of Singaporeans across the board. It analyzes how the PAP government has reached out, engaged, and listened to the people, adapted policies to address Singaporeans' changing needs and to fulfill their rising expectations, worked to deliver high standards of living, health care, education, and housing, created well-paying jobs and better futures, and sustained this performance year in and year out in good times and bad. And in doing so, earned the trust and mandate of the people and kept the virtuous spiral going another turn upwards. This book recounts how the PAP continuously transformed and renewed itself over the decades. It reorganized the party to strengthen its close ties to the people. It scouted, inducted, and groomed potential leaders with the right skills and values, and with diverse experiences and perspectives, while staying true to its core values of honesty, incorruptibility, and competence. This book also brings us behind the scenes where decisions were made, and it covers the internal debates within the party, the difficult choices and trade-offs, the reflections from our successes and failures. I must not give too much of the book away. Instead, I encourage you to read the book yourselves and learn more about the history of the PAP in Singapore. Much credit for the book goes to Sashi for putting everything together systematically and cogently. His PhD was in medieval history, but I'm glad he took up this project to study the contemporary history of Singapore. He understood the seriousness of the task, having been charged with it by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself and his policy experience in the civil service came in useful to contextualize and interpret the research materials. Shashi invested enormous time and effort over 10 years to research and write this book. He thoroughly reviewed party materials and government documents from the National Archives. He interviewed over 60 PAP leaders from the Central Executive Committee and HQ Exco members to backbenchers and PAP activists. Shashi, a big thank you for chronicling the PAP journey and writing a history that befits the significance of the subject. Many thanks also to the publisher and US Press and to the university that supports it. This is a scholarly tome that reflects credit on both. My final thanks are due to my comrades in the PAP who have shared their time with the author and contributed to the richness of the book, and especially to the comrades and friends of the party who walked the journey from 1985 to 2021. They've all served and contributed in their own different ways. We owe a great debt to them. I'm happy to have quite a few of them here with us today. Some are currently serving, like Chris D'Souza and Tan Wu Ming. Others have retired but continue to support the party cause and to share with younger generations their experience and wisdom. From the first generation, Mr. Ong Pang Boon, our first organizing secretary, Mr. Tang Si Chim, and Dr. Chiang Hai Ding. Also, Professor Jack Kuma, who is also pro chancellor, Mr. Chandra Das, Professor Lao Ping Sam, from the second generation. And from my own generation, Wong Kan Singh, Dr. Vasu and Ang Mong Singh. Thank you all for your many years of contributions and selflessness. The book ends just after the 2020 general election, neatly taking us one full circle since 1985. We are now once again at another turning point in the PAP's history, starting the next chapter of the PAP story. Just like in 1985, we are again in the midst of a leadership transition, this time from the 3G to the 4G team. 
The PAP MPs who were first elected in 1984 have all retired, except for me. The pioneer generation of voters, who were just beginning to leave the scene in 1985, have by now mostly faded away. About 60% of today's voters were born after independence. Growing up in a stable Singapore, they experienced steady progress year after year. They've benefited from our collective efforts to develop our economy and to build our Singaporean identity. Their aspirations, hopes and expectations are different from those of the young voters of yesteryear in the 1984 general election. Who are their parents? At the 2020 general election last year, the PAP again won a strong mandate from the voters. But our vote share fell by 8.6 percentage points. We also lost two GRCs to the opposition for the first time. As in 1985, many questions about the future are now in people's minds. How will the PAP deal with new challenges? How will the 4G team respond? Do they have what it takes to overcome adversity and take Singapore forward? Will the new generation have the same survival instincts to bond together with their leaders and gel together as one people? I hope this book will provide a sense of history and perspective to the journey that we've traveled in the past decades, help readers to appreciate how Singapore has achieved what it has done, but most importantly, inspire the next generation, party activists, party leaders, and Singaporeans alike, to be equally committed, resourceful, and resolute in pursuing a brighter future for Singapore. Just like in 1985, in 2021, no one can be sure what the future holds. The next 35 years will be quite different from the last, and we cannot simply take what's written in this book and transpose it into the future. Most fundamentally, our task is not to foretell the future, but to create it. The PAP continues to carry a heavy responsibility for Singapore's security, stability, and success. It must always work closely with Singaporeans to take the country forward. So that in 35 years' time, another historian writing another volume about the PAP will have as inspiring a story to tell of how the party continued to keep Singapore exceptional and successful through the decades. And whoever is launching that next book can do so with the same sense of pride and gratitude and thanksgiving as I have launching this book today. Congratulations again, Sashi. I wish your book every success. Thank you very much. Mr. If you will remain on stage, uh, Shashi, Mr. Sia, if you join us to launch the book. So, ready? One, two, three. The book is launched. Thank you very much. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you. And Dr. Jai Kumar will uh, present the Prime Minister with an inscribed copy of the book. Prapo, please join us for the photograph to mark the occasion.
This concludes the official portion of our book launch.